Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening if you're in the side of the world. Could be good morning, good afternoon, those uh, in other locations. So we are welcoming you this evening to what is going to be a, uh, a brief overview of, uh, of what we saw in 2021. And more importantly, about what we're looking at as, uh, as traders and analysts as we head into 2022. Um, for those of you that are just joining, I'm going to give it another uh, 30 seconds here and, uh, and let others get in. Um, if you can hear me loud and clear and you can see my screen, you should see a welcome screen for Tickmill. If you could type a Y into the chat box, that would be, uh, that would be helpful so I know we're, uh, we're good to go. Good stuff. Thanks very much, Christian. Just give it another few seconds here and we will start. Okay, once again, good evening. So um, what I'd like to do first of all is introduce our panel of experts here who are joining me this evening to cast their learned eyes over the market opportunities in the, uh, in the coming months ahead. Starting from my right to your left, we have Mike Sidel, who is our market expert from Germany. Mike has a strong interest in economics and investment since the early 90s and has pursued a degree in the field. Uh, following his academic endeavors, he became actively involved in the stock markets and obtained valuable knowledge during his apprenticeship as a banker and at a leading European bank. So it's uh, it's good knob, and I believe to Mike. Yes, hello and uh, welcome to our discussion for today. And if you have any questions, just feel free um, to use the chat to ask us live questions so we can answer if you have anyone in mind. Good stuff, thanks very much, Mike. And uh, next up is Joseph Tahria. He is our MENA analyst. Uh, Joseph is a professional technical analyst, avid researcher and trainer with over 10 years of experience in the financial markets. Joseph's insightful approach, <clears throat> excuse me, to analysis gives traders a solid understanding of what drives global financial markets and identifies trading opportunities using advanced Elliott Elliot Wave techniques. Uh, I believe it's uh, Mesa Ulia, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, for having me. My pleasure to be here with you tonight. Good stuff. Thanks very much. And <clears throat> last but not least, we have James Hart joining us. He's our market expert from the UK and covers the South African markets with over 10 years of experience as a private trader and professional market analyst. James has carved out an impressive industry reputation, able to both dissect and explain the key fundamentals in the markets. He communicates their importance and relevance in a succinct and straightforward manner. So James is joining us from London, so I believe it's good evening, Governor. Yeah, good evening, boss. Nice and cold here, as you might expect. Looking forward to, uh, to going through the points this evening and uh, very excited to hear what the other panelists have to say about these, uh, these themes that you have in mind. Excellent. Last but not least, it's, uh, it's yours truly. Uh, my name is Patrick Munley. Um, I'm dialing in from a uh, normally sunny, but tonight quite cold Mallorca. Um, I've been involved in the financial markets for the last 15 years as a self-educated professional trader and money manager. I've uh, mentored uh, both privately and in a uh, prop trading environment, hundreds of private traders of all experience levels from complete novices to former CME floor traders, in not just the technical skills, but the mental skills that are required to become proficient market operators. So now that you've been introduced to the panel, let's uh, jump into a brief overview of 2021. So it was a year that saw uh, huge inflation surprises across the globe, only some of which were really driven by COVID. Economists have attributed the rise in consumer prices over the past year to several factors, including supply chain breakdowns, labor shortages, and a sudden burst of spending after widespread lockdowns during the COVID pandemic. Because of the spike in inflation that can be traced to the economic impact of COVID-19, the most important thing to tame is going to be inflation. And this is important from a perspective of the pandemic starting to become under control. Until the pandemic really recedes, inflation is going to remain a problem. 
And from a market's perspective, low interest rates led to continued risk taking. Uh, the upswing that we saw in terms of the impact of meme stocks and crypto investing, with many investors chasing those through the Wall Street bets and Reddit forums. 2021 also had uh, a year of policy shocks in terms of the US and, and Europe, some of which positive and some of which were negative. Uh, they had varying impacts on assets and stocks. And really the last theme that has, uh, has become really crucial for us, I, I guess, as a, a global employee base, is the idea of how we're actually going to engage with employers in terms of our work situation uh, moving forward and what that will mean for uh, the impact of technology and how technology uh, will enhance a, a more balanced work life, uh, work life situation. And last but not least, um, the key climate issue that is really facing, uh, facing the globe as a whole and how uh, the disbursement of fiscal stimulus is going to uh, impact that and how we might see, start to see significant changes in terms of green and ESG investing. Um, so that's just a brief introduction there to uh, 2021 in terms of the key themes from my perspective anyway and from a training perspective. I don't know if any of you guys have any, uh, any input there with themes that I might have overlooked with respect to, uh, to 2021. Um, yeah, from my side, maybe a few words, um, uh, what I expect, uh, the difference between uh, 2021 um, to um, 2022. Um, maybe some words, the story of the Federal Reserve um, driven markets uh, will go on. So I think we had um, a 2021 uh, that was um, uh, ruled by COVID-19, by inflation, and uh, for sure uh, by uh, market-driven, the um, money-driven markets from the uh, from the Federal Reserves worldwide. And this year, uh, this year 2022, could be um, a different one. It's I guess it's 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 uh, still a, a Federal Reserve-driven market, uh, yeah, but uh, different one. But, uh, but this time uh, in a different way. While 2021 was uh, still supported uh, by a constant uh, money support um, from quantitative easing, uh, 2022 appears to become uh, a year of normality known from the time before 2008. You might know um, that was the year of the uh, Lehman bankruptcy in September 2008, and that was the start. Um, of the of the quantitative easing, and I guess um, the year 2022 um, will be a year um, that uh, might us bring the time before the bankruptcy. Um, so that means the the increasing interest, the uh, higher inflation, and uh, money flow uh, without the cheap money um, will rule the mar the, the markets. And I expect another tough year. Um, for the markets uh, with more focus to uh, regular economic results and uh, money shifts in kind of um, reallocations between uh, strong and weak assets and not only um, the cheap money from the central banks. Okay, that's, uh, that's a good perspective, Mike. Uh, any of you other guys have, uh, have a view on the uh, on 2021, 20, 20, I guess, being in the rear view mirror as such, but No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what you covered. I think, as you say, you know, sort of the main themes to focus on are initially going to be how the central banks start to react to this, uh, this surge in inflation. I think that brings us very much into this very sort of point where we are right now, uh, beginning the year. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to sort of jump into the, uh, to the points that we've got lined up. OK, so I guess one of the key themes, um, anyway, from, from my, my perspective as we head into, uh, into the start of this year is, the idea of um, the Omicron uh, variant moving us towards a uh, more of an endemic scenario as opposed to the pandemic scenario that we've we've obviously faced over the past nearly two years now. And certainly there seems to be a, a change in narrative with uh, within the scientific community, whereby there is a move towards the uh, the potential that we will that we will take this from being a, you know, a major global crisis to something that can be more, um, 
more controlled in so far, in so far, maybe not controlled in terms of the virus, but controlled in terms of our response to the virus. And so having survived that major scare at the back end of last year, um, consensus forecasts now for 2022 are clustered around a scenario of really continued strong growth, uh, potential for declining inflation, especially into the back half of this year, and gradual policy normalization. So while this Goldilocks outlook uh, may be the most likely outcome, uh, the risks around it are obviously still significant. COVID-19 distortions have made it really difficult to assess the underlying strength of the economy, and let alone really making valid forecasts for the year ahead. Um, the most important question is whether consumer, uh, consumer spending patterns, which were at the heart of the COVID economic shock, will return to pre-pandemic norms. Um, this will be profoundly important for 2022 outlooks, not just for the short-term uh, inflation trends, but also for how the prevailing market narrative starts to evolve around that. Uh, since the global industrial cycle plays such a pivotal role in, uh, in most leading indicators, a big decline in goods consumption, which is entirely plausible uh, later in this year, could rapidly transform this overheating narrative that we've started the year with and the ideas of a, a recession scare. So I guess tapering the pandemic support will be the great balancing act and challenge for the year to come. Um, if it happens too quickly, risk derailing the recovery, um, exiting too slowly, uh, risks propping up, uh, you know, an unviable, uh, some unviable businesses and sectors to at the huge expense to the, the public purse. And what were your thoughts on that, Mike? Um, uh, my, 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 my first uh, things that I think, I hope that um, uh, the, the COVID will end quite soon because of the impact for, for every one of us um, is, is uh, not the best one. And um, all of us would like to have a normal life back. Uh, would I say that's what I see here in my surrounding in, in Germany. Um, but from uh, from a trader's per perspective, this is this was I do every day. I, I trade the markets um, with my own money every day. And um, from from this state um, is the big question: Will we see um, an ongoing um, COVID nineteen pandemic? for the next months or will we switch uh, to the the enemy and this is this is a big question and from from the current state um, of the of the covid-19 uh, development uh, we might have the chance to switch from pandemic to endemic um, especially when we uh, see uh, the numbers in for example south africa where we had a really a really short uh, Term uh, from the from the Oricon, Omicron variant compared to uh, to the Delta and um, the next one. Um, what we see here is that Omicron appears uh, more infectious but uh, less deadly, and this one um, can be the chance for fast recovery for our economy. Um, but if not. This can happen. I'm no doctor. I, I don't know what 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 happens in the background. But if not, uh, the world um, is forced to find a way to live with the virus in an economic friendly coexistence. That means we have to find a way um, um, to uh, to live with the new future because of uh, the money will end any time uh, because of um, it's it's endless. It's not it's not endless and. Um, what we see, especially here in Germany, is that um, some businesses um, have plans um, to live with the virus. And this process um, will, ongoing pandemic or, or endemic, offer chances for me and you as active traders, because uh, what we have, uh, we have fear and we have optimism that drives the markets. And what I do as a trader, I try to find a way um, to, to trade um, with the situations um, that the virus impacts. When we see, for example, the earning season or whatever, um, the expectations that the companies have, and this is what, what drives the markets, what, what brings the prices on or down, up or down. And these um, are the things that I see every day and I try to find a way. So this is the big question where we see optimism or fear, and um, this is um, yeah, the world that we live at the moment. Good stuff. I guess that brings us um, kind of nicely on to 
uh, the next topic that I want to uh, to raise with you guys, and that's around um, the equity markets, and specifically a phenomenon for the U.S. equity markets as we head into um, into this year is the um, the idea that we are moving into the third year of the current presidential cycle, which historically has proven to be a tricky period for U.S. equity investors to navigate, certainly at an index level. Um, it's obvious that the S&P currently is trapped in a, in a bullish continuation trading range with increased volatility to both sides. Um, as, as risk rises, correlation moves towards really being almost gauged to one asset class and leverage tends to come out of equities at that point. Uh, the case in point being margin debt at the moment is falling at the fastest pace since uh, Lehman's failure from uh, $350 billion uh, to down to now $200 billion in recent months. A pullback uh, that starts in January, given the seasonal patterns, as you can see from the chart on the screen, um, tends to lead to an April to September, which are historically poor months for the, uh, for the S&P before we head into the back end of the year and we have uh, better performance. So in short, the S&P 500 is looking like it's in for a choppy uh, nine months and one might find the bull momentum gaining traction maybe into the back end of the year, early to late November. Um, the rationale really behind the performance of the S&P during this midterm election cycle is based really on seasonality. So the chart is likely due to the implementation of what are going to be probably uh, perceived as unpopular measures to curb the ever increasing deficit of the government, uh, tightening of the monetary policy with rate hike and tapering of the liquidity that's already starting to be felt in these early weeks of 2022. And so should 2022 behave in a similar fashion to the history of the US midterm election pattern, it will certainly prove to be a, a challenging year for the stock market. And from a, uh, from a chart perspective myself, I've been tracking a, the breakdown that we're currently seeing um, in the S&P 500. And I was just looking over at the live charts now, we're still seeing more weakness today. And certainly versus the swing highs that we have at the, uh, the 40, 40, uh, 79 area, we can look uh, we can look for a test down towards the 4500 area before potentially seeing some recovery into the February period. If we just look back at uh, at the seasonal chart, you can see that um, from a seasonal perspective, in the midterm election cycles, we've tended to find a, uh, a pretty tradable low there coming into the beginning of February. So I'm certainly going to be paying attention to that. From my uh, from my own personal trading, um, Joseph, do you have a view on the equity markets? Yes, Patrick. Like uh, as you mentioned, if we start a correction here on, on the U.S. indices or the equity markets, it will still be considered as a correction because in 2021 the the performance was was awesome for the S&P 500 and the U.S. indices. So if we retrace back like three to five or seven percent, it would still be considered as corrective. But because we mentioned Omicron with, uh, with my uh, colleague, Mike, let me talk about the, the, the strict restrictions China is, is implementing, which is the zero COVID policy. If the zero COVID policy is still there and the supply chain is still uh, being affected by China, and the prices are still going up, the inflation is there. The, the policies, the, the, the tightening policies that the central banks are, are using, the rate hikes, uh, the, borrowing, the borrowing cost will be higher for the companies and thus will be reflected by less profits for the companies. And we might see this right. selling pressure on, on the stock market. And uh, last but not least, like we saw the, the rate uh, decrease in China because of the last GDP uh, uh, numbers. And uh, because they do not have the inflation problem US and Europe have. So basically China is more comfortable by decreasing the, the, the interest rates and focusing more on the economic growth, that means uh, the, the big investors will tend to rotate. We will have some kind of rotation from the U.S. indices into the Chinese stock market at the moment. So basically, uh, yes, I will uh, uh, look into more selling pressure on the U.S. indices in the coming sessions. However, as you mentioned, it will still be corrective, considered to be corrective, uh, uh, compared to the 25 to 30% uh, profit or the, the outperformance 
uh, in 2021 uh, we witnessed. So basically, I will be looking at the same numbers on the SP500, Patrick, and we'll be looking to, to long the market again. If we saw uh, a after the rate decrease in China, we saw a lower yuan and a higher dollar, dollar against yuan. We might see here the multinational companies in the USA working with China. So if the do dollar is increased, on uh, uh, gained on the Chinese yuan, we might see more profits for these multinational companies. And here we, the large cap stocks will be affected positively and we might see some uh, another uh, buying uh, opportunities on the, on the indices and on the stocks. Good points, very good points, especially about the potential migration uh, out of US equities into China. I mean, the, um, there's a big push uh, in terms of the investment banking community towards the back end of last year, uh, yeah. pushing the idea that we would certainly see money potentially leaving the US and into Europe. As, uh, as, a, as, a, as one capital flow scenario, but um, equally it looks um, more than plausible that we could see that, that move to China. As it's almost now that China are kind of reacting to the same uh, issues that um, the, the Fed had back in 2008, when they were getting some systemic risk and the only response they had obviously was gonna be a huge monetary policy response. And that's kind of what you're almost seeing now from the PBOC as they're already starting with the rate cuts, et cetera, to defend initially we've had Evergrande and I'm sure there are plenty more, uh, plenty more skeletons in that closet. But uh, Mike, what do you think? Um, yeah, first of first, first thing, um, I like your chart of the S&P 500 and I like to hear uh, that Joseph is um, having the same numbers like you and I have also the same numbers. Um, and I personally uh, wouldn't say goodbye to the bull market in the S&P 500. We have at the moment a correction. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit considered about China uh, because um, China is at the moment um, yeah, where it is. Um, the market uh, gives the price um, and the price is right, but there are some risks in China that I see. Um, China has a good opportunity, how Joseph said before, because of they are a bit more relaxed uh, in the in the um, in the policy uh, with the with the interests, but um, the risk is uh, for sure. Uh, number one, uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, China is very restrictive uh, in that case, and the other one um, is um, likely effect from the real estate sector. You uh, you was talking about Evergrande. Um, with the money problem to pay back uh, credits and to pay um, the interests. And um, when uh, China will have a big problem uh, with the real estate sector, this will, um, this will affect other sectors like the financial sector um, that we've seen, for example, 2008 in, uh, in, in for example, in USA, uh, or the other sector are is the const construction sector. This, this can be a bit tricky uh, for, for the China uh, economy. Um, when we come back uh, to the to the USA, um, I will come back to the S and P 500. And at the moment, I see a bit more downside potential. Um, the chart that you have uh, shown here uh, shows the right numbers. Uh, and I don't want to go into a chart analysis. I would like to um, talk about um, the uh, the very important things for me, um, respective to the US markets. There are a few things that I have in mind. The first one. Um, is of course um, the inflation in, in USA as we have it in, in Europe too, but the USA might have a bit bigger um, issue with the inflation. And I guess a simple keep on going uh, with the price increases will generally be a strong danger for the markets. Um, uh, but I don't see this, uh, that we have a uh, um, um, still going on because a lot of the uh, increase are based uh, in uh, very low prices during the first COVID-19 market shock. Many companies reduced the um, production capacity and canceled orders from supply parts. And the fast recovery uh, from the economy was a surprise for many companies. And it takes time um, to reactivate the supply chains, inclusive uh, the transportation. Either we will see uh, lower prices through a higher supply, or we will see a lower prices through less demand. These are the two things that I see in USA. And um, the last is uh, the worst case for the economy 
and can affect the job market, worldwide BIPs, and at the end, uh, the worldwide economy growth. This is the problem that we see, that I see um, in, the, in the inflation. Um, the second one is um, how you mentioned before, Patrick, um, um, the, uh, the midterm election in the USA. This is definitive an event uh, with, um, with a market influencing character. Um, what Biden is trying to do is Biden will still be um, the president after Trump that will build America better. He has a program for this to support the country and to bring um, the economy to the next level. I, I personally um, expect the Biden administration will try to support America's economy um, through the billion heavy support program. Um, and the government orders in that case um, will have the chance to boost the uh, economy recovery and support the job markets. Um, but the real challenge for, um, uh, challenge for the market will be, I guess, COVID-19, um, the inflation um, progress. And one of the very important things is that um, the, is the risk of a wrong Fed approach. Uh, and I guess a simple plus. Um, how you asked us before, we will see a simple plus of 25% or so on. Uh, I guess a simple plus of 20% uh, year is nothing that I expect at this at this time of the year. I think we will. Um, um, it will be a good strategy uh, to trade um, extreme events like extreme sell-offs or extreme um, um, buy-overs in enthusiastic um, situations. This is. Um, what I have in mind for the stock markets, but also uh, for the US dollar, for example, or for the for the for the commodities. So that's my opinion. Good, good. Okay, well, look, let's uh, let's move it on in terms of thinking about um, inflation and um, and specifically the divergence between potential central bank policies. Um, as we are all probably aware, the you know the post global uh, COVID recovery we all anticipate should continue into 2022 with a uh, more gradual reopening of global service sectors as well as um, the easing of supply chain bottlenecks that have been plaguing the global manufacturing sector. Um, these developments should boost growth, but they could also hold the recent commodity price rally in its tracks as ultimately push global inflation down. Uh, the nascent G10. Um, central bank policy divergence that we've seen so far uh, could nevertheless flourish and give the FX carry trades a real boost as we head into 2022. Uh, 2022, I'm anticipating to be a year of two halves. Um, firstly, with the Fed's rate hike expectations amped fully up now, um, I'm anticipating that we could see one, one final leg higher in terms of the dollar. And then two, as we head into the back, into the second half of the year, as the relative gradual Fed tightening cycle um, should keep uh, US real yields and rates um, under pressure, I think, ultimately. I think what will happen is maybe we see something similar to 2018, where you know, the Fed were, or the market was pricing in a full tightening cycle for the Fed, and they made one move, and then they had to back off because uh, inflation you know, just wasn't there. And, um, and so suddenly they find themselves in a similar situation. We've already had uh, Goldman raise their, um, their rate high expectations from December to three hikes to January to four. Now, you know, maybe somebody's whispering in their ear and giving them the heads up on what's coming down the pipe, but there, there is a distinct change there in terms of their expectations. And maybe what it's doing is setting up the market for the idea that, you know, we're heading into this really um, aggressive tightening cycle, and then when that doesn't uh, doesn't transpire, that sets the stage then for equities to lift off into the into the back end of the year, for the dollar to to come under pressure, and for the euro to um, to find its feet again. So I mean, um, you know, the expectations at the moment, as you can see on the screen, are you know forecasting out now long run up to two point five percent, but I mean certainly this year. You've got them coalescing now around at least 1%, and Goldman are even more aggressive, aggressive than that. So in terms of the dollar index, for me, we're really sitting at a pivotal juncture. We're either going to take this channel out to the downside, 
And if we do, I think we can be looking for at least move back down to 92 and then potentially back down through the lows again. Or if we hold the channel, as I anticipate we may do in this early part of the year, get a move up one more high in terms of a test of potentially the 98 handle and then how that feeds into the euro dollar, which is in this down channel versus last year, the, the up channel that we had in terms of the dollar. Can we get one more low in the euro close to that 110 and this major trend line on the monthly there, you can see it even better. And then from there, build a real base to extend higher as the dollar rolls over once again. So, I mean, those are two key Forex trades that I'm watching as we, uh, as we head into the year. Uh, James, I know you are, uh, are an avid watcher of all things Forex. What, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, first off, you know, you've definitely raised some some very interesting and I think very pertinent points there, um, much of which I share. You know, I think in terms of my own trading, how I like to sort of utilize these, these fundamental perspectives, these macro inputs, um, is that I'm always looking to establish a sort of base case scenario with regard to forecasts and, and projections. And we all know how quickly these can change. Um, and so it's always interesting then to look at where the risks to these forecasts lie. Um, and I think, as you've said, you know, with the US dollar, so much is baked into the forecast at this point. Um, market positioning has been so elevated to the upside. And I think that even over recent weeks, we've already seen the chinks in the armor start to appear with what happens when um, the market expectations get ahead of themselves, positioning gets ahead of the game. And, you know, we've seen the US dollar failing to respond to that positive uh, inflation release last week, simply because it's already baked into the outlook. There's no further information there. There's no catalyst for continued buying. So I think if we extrapolate from that point forward into the year, you know, there's definitely a large risk that we see similar instances of either the Fed not living up to the market's expectations um, or simply underperforming in terms of the policy announcements made. Um, and also, you know, with regard to what happens with US data going forward as inflation starts to trail off over the year, if other risks start to emerge, um, then the USD, you know, knowing how quickly the market can get extended in terms of upside positioning with the dollar is certainly, um, is certainly vulnerable to these downside risks. And yeah, I mean, looking at the euro, but also looking at some of our currencies, uh, the Canadian dollar, the Japanese yen, I mean, we had the Reuters report this week, um, you know, reporting on the Bank of Japan, discussing how to sort of telegraph rate hikes. So obviously there's going to be some sort of catch up in terms of other central banks kicking into gear this year, which should create some interesting shifts in dynamic. And yeah, I mean, the euro is certainly one that I'm looking at as well. Um, the dollar yen, I think there's definitely going to be some interesting action there as we move through into, into Q2 and the, the second half of the year. Um, and also, you know, with regard to the Canadian dollar at the moment, I mean, we're seeing a lot of strength tied in with oil prices. Obviously, the Bank of Canada was one of the first off the mark last year in terms of tightening. Um, and so there's a great deal of attention on how the Bank of Canada is likely to proceed now, especially as we track these, these movements in oil markets. Um, so I think, yeah, certainly keeping an eye on where these sentiment buildups occur and where the risks lie in terms of, uh, you know, identifying some more contrarian trades is certainly how I would go about playing these, um, these major themes. Yeah. Good stuff, really good. Um, Joseph? Yes, Patrick. I think you've got a pretty strong view on, uh, on, on inflation. Like I've been, I've been following up with the tiny, tightened policies, I've been following up with the dovish tone for the Federal Reserve since uh, last year. And after seeing the inflation going out of control, CPI near 7%, uh, in Britain today, the 5.4% the, the was the CPI <clears throat> in Britain. So it's the highest since three, four decades. And now the tightening policies, we, uh, the, the market is already discounting a rate hike in March. Uh, as you mentioned, like uh, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, they, they were saying that there, it should be three or four hikes, but like we're now hearing more about five, six or seven hikes. We were hearing about 25 basis point rate hikes. Now we're talking about 50 basis point rate hikes. So basically uh, the inflation is here. However, the tightening policies and the rate hikes uh, are only, uh, we are only hearing about this stuff, but they are not being implemented. So if the Federal Reserve here, Jerome Powell, needs to uh, uh, hold the tool and try to fix 
uh, the market and try to take control over, we need to see him stepping in early, earlier than March. This is in my opinion, because, okay, even if we hear that the rates are, are going to high, however, we're not seeing these hikes anymore. The market is discounting the high, the, the US 10 years yield is trading near 1.92%. And this is putting some uh, buying pressure on, on the dollar index, as you mentioned. And I like the graph, by the way. So I, we might see some push higher to the, for the dollar index in the coming future because of the higher yields. However, because of the different central bank policies, uh, we might not see a pressure on, on the other currencies. Like even if we see higher dollar index, we might not see uh, the, the euro drop or the pound. Uh, for, for Bank of England, seven out of nine members were, reject, were rejecting or were against uh, higher rates. And after hearing the Federal Reserve going into these, uh, the, the path of, of higher rates, they already uh, hired their rates by, by 0 0.1 basis points. So basically, the pound, I think, is the most interesting currency to be in the 2022. And it will lead the way uh, toward more, uh, uh, more profits uh, in, in the coming sessions. So basically, uh, and we, we heard the president of China telling, uh, the, the, telling the world that you need to watch out of the pace of the hikes. Uh, this is because uh, the, the higher interest rates will affect the economic growth. And uh, basically, we need, to, we need to see when will the right hike, uh, hike, um, the hike happen. And we, we need to see by how much will it happen. I'm afraid of buying the rumor, selling the fact, and when it comes to higher rates, it's not enough for the inflation. The only good thing we heard recently is the lower PPI in China. Lower PPI, that means the CPI, the coming CPI in China will be lower. That means we might see a little bit of a turn of, uh, let's say, a less pace, less higher pace, less pace uh, of the inflation. So if we, because of the PPI, and we might expect lower CPI. That means Jerome Powell and uh, his expectation of the inflation uh, uh, turning a, li a little bit lower uh, in the second uh, quarter would be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, near near uh, reality. And as you mentioned, if uh, if we started the rate hike and the inflation started to going down, and we might be we might be surprised of a let's say uh, stop this tightening policy. And here we might see a drop in the dollar index and retest the previous lows, as you as you mentioned. I'm looking forward to long the, the pound. I'm looking forward to long the euro in 2022. I see a good opportunity in the, in the currencies because the investors right now are don't have much, uh, let's say, choices to choose in terms of investments. The stock market is a is a, is an in, in an uncertainty. Uh, the cryptocurrency is as well retracing. So basically, holding the fiat currencies right now is the best choice to do and looking for the next step to, to, to put in your, uh, your investments. Good stuff. Okay, well, moving on directly, I guess, from currencies, and certainly they, you, you started to reference them in terms of uh, the commodity complex. And um, I'm really thinking, I guess, in terms of what we've seen so far in this cycle has been a... Um, a brief outperformance by the industrial metals, obviously driven predominantly by the reopening trade. But um, what we can be looking at now, I guess, uh, what, and this is a chart that I've been tracking for a while, um, is, the, is the gold chart, which has been consolidating in this long-term triangle, um, consistently setting higher lows, despite, uh, most importantly, the rise in US rate high expectations. Uh, so, and we've obviously seen that rise in the dollar. So. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive to see the uh, gold holding up as it is. Um, and if potentially we now have rate hikes fully priced, uh, gold is, got, is setting the potential here to break from the triangle to the upside. Certainly, if we start to see that dollar weakness develop in, uh, in the latter half of uh, the early part of this year into the, the latter part of the year in total, um, this is something that... Uh, there's the old trader phenomenon when something is moving higher on bad news, it, uh, it really really means that it wants to move a hell of a lot higher as, uh, as the good news develops for it. So um, gold is, is a chart that I'm tracking. And, uh, and you can see even today, we're seeing that push up again towards the, uh, the triangle resistance. We've got silver in a descending wedge pattern there and starting to, to push 
push higher as well. And, uh, and last but not least, we have our old friend, Dr. Copper, who's, uh, who's in this bullish consolidation pattern uh, towards the top end of its range and, and also looking at the potential for a breakout. And, uh, and last but not least, we have crude oil, which has, has really been the story of the, of the start of this year, um, driven not just by supply, but also now geopolitical concerns. We were talking offline before we, we went live here about uh, the issues in Russia and the Ukraine and how that could have a dramatic impact upon uh, crude oil prices. And then taking it right back to the beginning of the presentation where we were talking about ESG and and clean investing, um, one thing's for, for pretty much absolute certain that we've seen a nearly $2 trillion ESG driven um, CapEx cleanse from oil and gas exploration uh, to take it to, to multi-decade lows. And so at this stage, if we've got a geopolitical spike, maybe in, in uh, Russia and Ukraine, you know, does that send crude oil back up to $100 a barrel? And then what impact does that have on global growth and you know we all know where uh, crude oil was trading um, when we headed into 2008 and the implications of that crude oil spike um, so i mean these commodities are are pretty finely balanced at the moment and if we if we do start to see that weakness uh, translate into the dollar and uh, and these commodities take off that could be a, a pretty meaningful uh, meaningful shock to a lot of consensus views for the year ahead james yeah, I mean, again, you know, a number of great points there. Um, I think in terms of, you know, the most sort of pertinent right now, obviously these these geopolitical risks um, around Russia and Ukraine present a very sort of real risk of, of volatility, um, you know, in the, in the safe haven assets as well across the sort of risk complex. Um, and I guess, you know, in terms of thinking about how we ended last year and how we started this year, I suppose one of the big factors is, um, you know, focusing on oil specifically, is that with the passing of these Omicron risks and with the sort of utilization of a lot of pent up demand that was in the, the global economy, looking ahead now, if, if the pandemic is reaching an endemic stage and if domestic and, and international restrictions start to ease further um, and the return of global travel comes back in, in sort of a big way across this year, then, you know, you'd have to think that over the first half of the year, the outlook for, for oil looks, looks fairly solid. Um, I mean, there's the holy grail of the European uh, summer tourist season, which, you know, was, there was a lot of hope last year that it was going to return, but obviously it didn't, it never came to fruition. Um, and now with lots of, lots of countries talking about scaling back restrictions over the coming quarters, um, you'd have to think that heading into that period, the demand from the aviation sector, which of course is, you know, the, the second largest sector in terms of demand for, for oil globally, um, is going to keep oil prices supported. But then as we cross into the summer and as the summer tourist season, especially in the West, starts to weaken, then it's a case of at which point does the oil supply tip over into a uh, surplus from deficit, because obviously at the moment we're stop, still operating um, in a global deficit. OPEC have yet to you know, fully scale out of their production cuts, which are due to end in September. So by that point, you know, we might be in a much more balanced state um, if a lot of these supply chain issues have, have cleared up by that point as well. Um, and global trade is, is operating in a more sort of efficient manner, then it might be a case of the oil market seeing a final push into sort of Q3, Q4, and then that might prove to be the end of that rally for now. So yeah, that's certainly going to be a chart that I'm tracking. And then in terms of gold, I guess to add another sort of a famous trader adage, yeah, it's a case of what can't go down must go up. I mean, we've had all of the usual inputs that would typically weigh on gold prices. We've had higher equities prices. Um, we've had a higher US dollar. And throughout all of this period, gold has, has sort of managed to keep itself together. So I think for now, looking ahead, especially you know, in light of the conversations we've had around these US dollar downside risks, um, you know, you'd have to think that there, there is some more upside in gold. It looks, from a technical perspective, especially, um, like a, a coiled spring ready to sort of explode for now. So yeah, oil and gold definitely looking for further upside, especially in the near term. Um, and yeah, that's that's sort of my my view on those. Good, yeah, and it's a good point as well about the Q3, uh, Q4 uh, peak that we often see in, um, in crude oil, especially as that US driving season comes to a conclusion. Um, pretty much as we saw this year, you, you tend to see 
uh, crude oil prices taper off into into the back end. So that's a, that coupled with, as you said, the supply issues could be uh, could be a meaningful uh, pivotal point for for crude oil this year. Um, Mike, I think you've got a couple of views to to share on the commodity complex. Yes, for sure. And uh, I have uh, I have the two two sectors that you mentioned before. Uh, number one um, is uh, the outperformance of the uh, industrials versus the the previous metals. Uh, and after them, uh, a few um, ideas um, regarding um, oil. Maybe we will have um, first look to the uh, to the metals um, and the, the huge difference between uh, between industrial and precious metals um, is the fact that precious metals have the uh, reputation of an inflationary compensation. Um, that means the the current sideward movements that we see, for example, in the in the gold chart that you've shown before um, in the weekly or the monthly was it with the triangle um, are a sign of um, indecision or doubts about the sustainability sustainability of a high inflation. Um, I, I guess the question is um, regarding the inflation, uh, when will we see the peak? Because of when we see a peak in the inflation, um, I guess the gold price uh, will not go up to the sky. Um, this is the thing that I see here, because um, when we see a decreasing uh, inflation rates, uh, the pressure on gold um, is gone. And the second one is um, the ratio, uh, or better said, the correlation um, between um, gold and silver um, to the US dollar. In the last months, we've seen a strong dollar uh, was never good for a strong gold price uh, and the opposite too. And the question is now, uh, what will happen with, with the US dollar and the inflation when we see um, an inflation peak in the next month, we might see uh, a dropping um, interest market. And this will be the situation when I expect gold uh, will fall again. So the situation um, in, in the precious metals is a bit tricky. Um, but by the way, for the moment, I'm quite bullish um, in gold and, and in silver, especially through the, the seasonals. We are still uh, in a bullish um, um, seasonal for gold and silver. And so we have the chance um, to uh, get some, some, some following trades into the bull side that we've seen the breakout in silver uh, and gold. This is what I see at the moment. But in the long term, I'm not really sure if we will um, have really high prices uh, in the gold market. Um, respective to the industrial metals, uh, on the other hand, um, the rally is driven by a, a, a strong economic demand and um, partially limited av availability. And uh, this is the fact, uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, that um, the, the precious metals um, will be for the futures the better trades because of especially when we see uh, the chart of copper it's it's a quite bullish market and we can um, trade copper fantastic with Ticknell and when you see a chart like this this is a bull market chart compared with the uh, with the chart of, of silver uh, and gold this is not really bullish this is um, yeah actually not really something that I would like to trade in long term um, but copper for example. I guess copper will have a huge demand in the in the future because of um, um, the opportunity for copper in the in the new markets uh, that the the USA and the rest of the world is interested of a greener energy. We need, for example, um, new um, new um, um, areas to transport the power from uh, from the wind source. Uh, to the people uh, where they live. And this needs a lot of copper, for example. And I guess these things uh, will bring a lot of demand for copper and this will uh, be fine uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the uptrend. And uh, then let's switch over uh, to the uh, resurgence of oil. In my opinion, um, and I'm, I'm at the moment I'm, I'm, I'm bullish in oil and I guess we will see um, increasing prices 
the reason therefore is uh, that in my opinion oil is still um, the lubricant for the economy and the way to a green industry will need a lot of oil for production and uh, transport for example for motor fuel and so on and as long as the economy um, can pay the high prices uh, of oil we will see higher prices and um, how Goldman Sachs said in the last study um, they expect prices between 100 and 125 in, in, in 2022 and uh, nearly uh, 150 dollars in 2023 and Goldman said the economy will be able to pay this and and this is uh, what I guess will drive uh, the markets to to higher prices that we've seen in history um, and the next one is is the OPEC the OPEC has the plan uh, to be back at the pre COVID production in September 22. Um, therefore, the plan to increase um, the monthly output by 400,000 barrels. But at the moment, um, they have, even now, they have a problem to fill the plan. Uh, that mines um, the riots in Saudi Arabia and Russia are also risk for the production. And uh, with these things in mind, um, from this side, um, there is more upside potential. Um, but we should ever, ever have an eye uh, what the economy is doing with the oil prices. Uh, but too high prices will have negative effects uh, to the world economy, uh, respectively the demand for oil. And these are the things that will drive the oil price in the next months, in my opinion. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Patrick, Doris. may I add something? Joseph, the floor yeah, is yours. Uh, yeah, like uh, um, I just want to mention something like uh, based on a small study I've made on the correlation between the gold and the inflation prices. If you go back to 1970, uh, 1970s, 1975, this uh, uh, like and 1980, 1985, these two, uh, let's say, brackets in history, we had the highest inflation uh, in all time. So if you look back into gold, the gold was <laughs> yielding negative, to be honest. So basically, the correlation was not positive between gold and inflation, and it will never be. Uh, gold will hold its prices against inflation on long term, maybe five to 10 years. However, they are not positively correlated on a on short term. Uh, the real estate investment trusts uh, were like positively correlated more in terms of inflation rather than gold. Uh, in gold, at the moment, you mentioned the real yields. The, the real yields at the moment are negative. So it's a good environment for, for gold, even if the uh, yields <coughs> are going up. However, if we adjust inflation from the yields and we, took, we take into consideration the real yields, the negative yields, real yields at the moment is a good opportunity for gold and will boost gold. They are 99.8% positively correlated, uh, excuse me, negatively correlated. So basically we'll look into more uh, upside uh, momentum on gold. And as James mentioned, technically speaking, gold is, is forming a good structure to go higher. 1860 is the first target. If broken, we can see much higher prices. As for oil, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to witness like the geopolitical tensions between Russia and, and Ukraine at the moment. And uh, we need to see the strategic oil uh, U.S. and China that will use as a tool to put some pressure on the prices. It didn't work with the 50 million barrels previously. However, we would look this time if both U.S. and China like had a good connection or good, let's say, uh, they put their hands together in terms of putting some pressure on the energies. And we will see that if, if, if this will make uh, some... Uh, some change in the future but like i still see oil have some uh, uh, good resistance near 93 dollars per barrel barrel and i'm looking forward to a big correction towards the 70 dollars 75 dollars again good stuff good stuff okay look let's uh let's move this on into the uh Final topic here, we've been running for about 45 minutes so uh we just want to finally touch on um the uh, the hot market, I guess, of last year, and not so hot as we've headed into uh, the start of this year, and that's the uh, the crypto sphere. Um, obviously, we've had Goldilocks conditions. 
um, which are ending and the liquidity tide that has potentially funded the, uh, the move that we've seen in terms of cryptocurrencies over the past year, certainly. Um, and now we need to, I guess, reassess, are we looking at disproportionate harm to what has been a very, uh, by many people's uh, assessment, a very overvalued asset class, uh, particularly driven by, by speculative flows. Um, we still haven't seen from a, an institutional perspective and the two charts I'm posting, I'll post the uh, Ethereum one in a minute. These are the, the futures charts. Um, so this is really a gauge of when the institutions got involved in the market and what the institutional flows are. I mean, we've obviously seen the uptake of um, Mike Novogratz and his fund, Galaxy, and uh, it was last year was all the rage, but um, we've certainly come into this year and there has been a, uh, let's say, a, a position washout, to put it mildly. Um, we're now back testing some pretty pivotal levels, certainly in terms of Bitcoin. That trend line, trend line sorry, I've got marked there, um, is, uh, is in peril of giving way. And if it does, then we could, uh, we could see another downdraft in terms of Bitcoin. And Ethereum, uh, you, again, this is just the futures contract. So this isn't the spot price going back to creation. But in terms of the futures contracts, and you've got to bear in mind that this is what a lot of uh, the big money managers are looking at, at their trading desks, uh, you can pretty clearly see uh, the channel downside objective there that could be in play before we see a, a really meaningful bounce in terms of Ethereum. And Ethereum then has other challenges, certainly from the whole NFT drive that we're seeing as well, and whether or not Ethereum is uh, is going to be a competitor in that space. So um, I, I'll be honest with you, it's it's not my, uh, my sphere of expertise by any stretch of the imagination, but from a technical perspective, we seem to be... Uh, pretty close to a precipice here. So it's either uh, a make or break type scenario uh, from my perspective. James, you've uh, you've been dabbling in crypto recently. What, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you that one of the sort of, you know, the main, the main themes to sort of focus on at the moment is definitely this increased level of institutional engagement and what that's actually done to the cryptocurrency markets because structurally there's been a, a sort of seismic shift in how these markets are behaving over the last sort of six months or so um, and I mean it's almost at the point now where you can talk about cryptocurrencies uh, almost like sort of euro spreads you know you have core spreads and you have periphery spreads with cryptocurrencies now we have the market leading coins obviously bitcoin litecoin ethereum etc and then we have all of these altcoins, which still see sort of outsized gains from time to time, behave in a much more volatile way. And I think, you know, as this institutional engagement continues to increase, that the sort of market leading coins, especially um, the ones that you've mentioned here, are behaving much more like traditional market assets. And, you know, as risk assets, we've seen Bitcoin and Ethereum selling off as US rate hike expectations have kicked into gear. This again is a theme that's likely to continue. We've also seen a real dialing back of the volatility, which sort of made these assets famous. I mean, we haven't seen any of the big sort of spikes or even any sort of the big drops really um, over the whole of this decline from recent highs. Um, and then I guess, you know, in terms of, of, of structural changes as well, as you say, there's been a massive positioning clear out and you have to think to yourself that a lot of the speculative um, cash that was chasing action in Bitcoin last year certainly is either now out of the market and is looking at, you know, what's happening in this altcoin space or has moved into other areas. I mean, for example, you mentioned NFTs. It's very feasible that a lot of the money that was made in Bitcoin during these sort of effervescent periods last year has now been siphoned off into other areas. And so you're left with, um, you know, a lot more sort of um, stable hands in Bitcoin at the moment, hence the sort of relatively boring price action. Um, but I think, you know, looking ahead, it's probably worth noting that open interest in Bitcoin at the moment is around sort of all time highs, um, which is interesting because if we think about the sort of dynamic with regard to it being a more like a traditional risk asset, if we are linking it back to the conversation we've been having about um, downside risks in the US dollar this year, um, then what that actually would set up for, the conditions are sort of ripe for a short squeeze in the near term. So if we do see any sort of um, underperformance in the US dollar, then it might be a case that we do actually see some, some renewed upside um, in Bitcoin. And as you say, I mean, looking at the charts, they're obviously 
sitting on a precipice right now, but I would say, you know, against the ropes, but, but not down. So certainly going to be interesting to see what happens over these sort of coming months in Bitcoin. But again, with these structural changes, it seems unlikely that we go back to the sort of fireworks spectacle show that we, that we saw last year. Good points. So it's like Mike Tyson. Everyone's got a plan until they're punched in the face. Don't we know it? Don't we know it? Um, Joseph, what do you think? Yep. Like, uh, um, to be honest, I'm not following up with the cryptocurrency market at all, but like, uh, I have some ideas about it. And I would like to mention these uh, hey, tips to James. I don't know if you agree with me. Like, the cryptocurrency market, the advantage uh, should, should have been that this market is decentralized it's free of and free from the effect of the central bank policies but right now you mentioned that bitcoin was affected by a rate hike and we are seeing lately some kind of correlation between bitcoin and the nasdaq and the tech companies so basically this is not what cryptocurrencies or the cryptocurrency holders would like to see in the future some uh, effect from these policies or the central bank policies the decentralization is something they want they want their money in their pocket they 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 want to to move out from the bank uh, sector and try to be free with their money to exchange it easily but uh, in the future i think that uh, the effect will still be there and uh, from a technical point of view uh, patrick the tracement in in, uh, in Bitcoin, I think five waves have completed on Bitcoin, and we are seeing a three wave pullback. Uh, Twenty nine nine hundred is a is a is a target for me at least technically on the Bitcoin. Twenty nine nine hundred thirty thousand is a is a good support uh, on a like medium term a view. If it holds, we might still looking too long, but I would prefer to long other uh, cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum because it have the project of maybe I have an NFTs and it's used for mining and I'm looking for some, some other payment solutions like the uh, Ripple, XRP, the, the ADA, the Cardano. So I, I believe that there is much more potential in these currencies. Uh, I don't know if James agree other than the Bitcoin because it's expensive and if it want to be uh, 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 traded by or used or to be the future, I think it should be much more affordable. So I would like to see the Bitcoin falling back to some reasonable prices. I don't want to mention these prices on this live. Okay, good stuff. Well, uh, that's, uh, that brings us to an end in terms of the, the topics uh, we thought as a panel were important to, to keep you abreast of as we head into the, the early parts of um, 2022. We will um, probably, as we did next year, do an update into the middle of the year and, uh, and probably update and if not dramatically change our views. <laughs> um, but, uh, what we're hoping is that you, uh, you've got a sense of, of what we're thinking in terms of the current market situation, the market dynamics, uh, the market narratives and the market structures and, and price points that we're paying attention to um, in the near term. As always, you know, it's uh, you're pretty much looking at tea leaves until uh, until we get closer to some of these key events that we're heading into. Uh, the Fed expectation and the rate hike cycle, obviously, being absolutely paramount for um, for this year. So, what I'd like to do now is just briefly um, open up uh, a, a Q and A here. If anyone's got any questions with respect to anything we've covered, or um, they have a topic that's um, they, they feel is important to them that they'd like us to give a perspective on, uh, you can either type that into the Q&A or into the chat box. And, uh, and I'm sure uh, one of us will be able to, uh, to give some sort of informed perspective on it. Um, so we'll just, uh, we'll just open that up now and, um, and let's see if we have any, uh, any issues that require clarity or, uh, or someone wants to open up a new topic for discussion. So like I say, if you type into the chat box or into the Q&A box, equally, if you don't have a question, it's helpful for us if you type an N, um, as then we know we've done a, a really good job of explaining our, our thoughts and perspective on the, on the current markets and, uh, and we can wrap the session up here.
Well, guys, I am. Uh, I'm guessing from the uh, the current radio silence that a round of applause to uh, to all of you, as uh, as you've done a fantastic job of um, of informing the group on your your insights and perspectives uh, as we head into the early part of this year. And like I say, we will uh, will aim to reconvene middle of the year and uh, and reassess where we're up to and where we see the next uh, next major opportunities. Uh, for the for the second half of the year. So I'd like to thank um, I guess Mike, Joseph and James for their time this evening. And thank you Patrick. And, thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, we will uh, we hope to join you all again in uh, in the middle part of the year. You can catch us all pretty much through the uh, the Ticknell blog with um, our updates near term uh, in terms of trading opportunities and uh, and our opinions on on markets and how things are developing pretty much on a daily basis. So thank you very much, guys, for your time this evening. And thank you for all those who attended. I hope you've, uh, hope you've enjoyed this and, uh, and got some value. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 See you next time.